In 1873, a global recession hit. Lasting until 1879, the Long Depression, as it's now called, hit on the heels of the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. As you can imagine, this depression hit the working classes much more harshly than it did the wealthier classes, and now, after efforts at reform between the 1830s and 1850s, the working class was poised to become a vocal class, and one with some political clout. Now, the political classes had to pay attention to them. In England and in Germany, mass politics took on a decidedly real politic flair, as the varied political parties vied for support and then attempted to parlay that support into legislation. While both countries were, at least nominally, constitutional monarchies, the constitutions governing each state were quite different, which then led to very different experiences as they headed into the era of mass politics. Britain's empire, after 1800 it was officially the United Kingdom, did not have one governing document, but rather a series of parliamentary acts that together serve as a constitution. The first of these documents, the Magna Carta, was adopted in 1215, but it was really the 1689 documents, the English Bill of Rights and the Crown and Parliament Recognition Act, which dictated parliamentary sovereignty and truly limited the rights of the English monarchs. And by the middle of the 19th century, there were only three other acts which served as part of the British Constitution, and all those really did was recognize the growing British Empire, the addition of Scotland and then Ireland. Thus, any reform of the British political system, such as the 1832 reform, which expanded the admittedly male electorate, reformed just how the system worked, not the actual governance of the system, which meant that enforcement was quite varied. In Britain, the fight for reform was inhibited by the start of the conservative Victorian era, an era which revolved around the figure of British Queen Victoria. Born in 1819, Alexandrina, named after her godfather, the late Tsar Alexander I of Russia, Victoria was 11 years younger than Napoleon III and four years younger than Bismarck. A granddaughter of George III's, she had been raised primarily by her very German mother, her father had died in 1820, if you'll recall, and it was something of a surprise to find that, at the age of 18 in 1837, she was to become England's monarch after the death of her uncle William. In October of 1839, Victoria proposed to her cousin Albert, the Duke of Saxony, and in 1840, three years after her accession, they married. By all accounts, it was a happy marriage, as the two were very much in love. Over the next 17 years, they would become parents to nine children, all of whom survived into adulthood, and most of whom married into noble or royal families in Europe. While it was a happy marriage, the two were not equals. Parliament did make Albert a naturalized British citizen, but refused to give him a peerage, a British title. He was thus never crowned king, and in fact once commented, quote, I am a husband, but not master in the house. It wasn't until 1857 that he was officially recognized as the royal consort with the title Prince Consort. Of Victoria's early years, marked as they were by uncertainty due to her youth and gender, were also marred by no less than three assassination attempts, two by the same individual as he'd escaped capture the first time. While serious, Victoria's leniency, rather than death, the men were sentenced to transportation, were positively viewed by the people, and her reputation underwent a shift. She was no longer that German princess, she was in fact the British Queen. Now at the time of Victoria's accession, Parliament had just become more conservative. The Prime Minister was William Lamb, Lord Melbourne. He immediately gained more power as he essentially served as Victoria's mentor until he left office in 1841. His influence may have assured that Victoria was a lifelong conservative. Sir Robert Peel's conservatives won the general election in 1841, but Peel was a reformer conservative, and his government pushed through the Mines Act of 1842, which prohibited females from working in the mines, the Factory Act of 1844, which limited women's and children's working hours to 10, and the repeal of the Corn Laws, although this last was done without conservative support and instead with Whig or liberal support, although also with the support of the Queen. And while staying out of the public eye in the political sphere, 
Victoria reacted with offense if a government official acted without her knowledge and or her consent, and she took great interest in foreign affairs, particularly in cultivating a new friendship with France. This interest began under the reign of Louis-Philippe, who was related through marriage to Victoria's mother. But Victoria enjoyed a great friendship with Napoleon III. They shared a common view that a monarch, while somewhat authoritarian, should nonetheless allow for limited reform. Now, Victoria even meddled in political affairs with Prussia. She and her husband arranged the marriage of her daughter to the Prussian Prince Frederick Wilhelm in 1858. By all accounts, in Victoria's own letters and diaries, she hoped that Prussia's new connection with Britain would bring about some reform of a liberal, that is, constitutional, bent in Prussia. Duh, of course, it didn't. In 1861, Victoria's public political life for all intents and purposes ended. In May of that year, her mother died. In reading her mother's papers afterward, Victoria realized that her mother, while overprotective, had loved her dearly, and she deeply mourned that loss. Worse, in December, Albert died of typhoid. Victoria was unconsolable at his loss. She was convinced that Albert's illness had been exacerbated by his worry over their eldest son, whose name was Edward. Now, the Prince of Wales was, at the time, involved in a very public affair with an Irish actress. Well, Victoria would blame her son for Albert's death. She wore black for the rest of her life, and she rarely went out in public after Albert's death. This earned her the nickname, the Widow of Windsor. Well, Victoria's influence on the cult of domesticity really dates to this time period, to the 1860s, when she, both publicly and privately, seemed to embody the perfect Victorian woman. This woman lived a quiet, moral life. She married young, tended first to her husband and children, and only then worked to better herself. She created a peaceful and cozy and loving home and instructed her children in moral living. She didn't speak up against her husband, at least not publicly, and she did her very, very best to stay in the background. Now, as you might imagine, Victoria's life itself served as a limitation to the ideas of women's rights first espoused during the Enlightenment and French Revolution. The various reform parties of Britain had not seriously taken up the call for women's rights. Even socialists insisted that women just needed to wait for the socialist revolution when everyone would get the rights they wanted. They saw no need to press for women's issues in particular. Agitators for women's rights found their first serious voice in the utilitarian party. Utilitarianism is the belief that the moral worth of an action is determined by its contribution to its overall utility to society. Utilitarians lived life, and politics, by the greatest happiness principle. Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, which is pleasure, absence of pain. They are wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. In 1869, 11 years after the death of his wife, John Stuart Mill, the ostensible leader of the British utilitarians, published The Subjection of Women, which argued that society trained women, quote, from the very earliest years in the belief that their ideal of a character is the very opposite to that of men, end quote. And that in order to have truly strong societies, women's rights and equality to men needed to be recognized. John Stuart Mill had viewed his wife Harriet as his partner in all things, and he didn't understand why other people could not also see women in this way. And while society as a whole would not immediately take up his challenge, individual women, creating a widespread suffrage movement throughout the world, would eventually achieve this goal of equal rights although not until after World War I. Utilitarians, which were considered a subgroup of the liberal philosophy, were outliers in the mid and late 19th century of Britain. Historically, utilitarians, who were considered a subgroup of the liberal philosophy, were outliers in mid and late 19th century Britain. Historically, liberals had stood for the expansion of civil rights, precisely what the utilitarians wanted, Yet, in Britain and elsewhere, when liberals became politically powerful, they tended to restrict the rights of several minority groups, like the working poor or the landless or women. As labor agitation grew worse, 
Some liberal groups abandoned their agenda of universal male suffrage and sided instead with more conservative parties in urging governments and employers to crush demonstrations violently. In the wake of the revolutions of 1848 and the Paris Commune of 1871, business and governments viewed massive numbers of striking workers as the first step to political unrest and violence. Unfortunately for them, worker activism was an inevitable reaction to the industrial innovation which had so quickly changed society. As the 19th century entered its final decades, workers organized formal unions, attracting the allegiance of millions of workers. From the 1880s on, the pace of collective action for more pay, lower prices, and better working conditions would accelerate. This acceleration was prodded by the rise of mass journalism after 1880. A mass journalism gave Europeans ready access to information and misinformation about politics and world events. The invention of automatic typesetting and the production of newsprint from wood pulp lowered the costs of printing quite dramatically. And the telephone, Bell's device invented in 1876, allowed reporters to communicate news to their papers almost instantly. Where newspapers had, at one time, been focused around philosophy and literary content, they now focused instead on the sensational, using banner headlines, dramatic pictures, and gruesome or lurid details to sell papers. They also became tied to a particular political view. For instance, the Manchester Guardian was tied to a moderate line associated with the desires of mill owners. It's only been since the 1950s that the Guardian has adopted its more liberal reputation. A journalism created a national community of up-to-date citizens who, whether or not they could vote, knew about the political climate of their nations. Newspapers were no longer meant for quiet reflection in the home, but rather for quick reads on mass transportation or right out on the streets. Even as elites grumbled that the sensational press was a sign of social decay, up-and-coming people from the working and middle classes believed that mass journalism provided them an avenue to success. As major European cities such as London, Vienna, Berlin, and St. Petersburg became centers of both politics and news, a number of European politicians, influential in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, would get their start working for daily newspapers. And so came the reforms. A British liberal reforms had begun with the Reform Bill of 1832, which extended the franchise to most middle-class men. The Reform Bill of 1867 extended suffrage to all male householders, so about two million adult males were now eligible to vote. The Ballot Act of 1872 made voting secret, a reform supported by those who wished to limit the influence of landlords and employers who beforehand had been able to know how everyone they worked with voted. These British reforms had an immediate impact on disaffected tenant farmers in Ireland. Armed with a secret ballot, these men behaved less like colonized people, opening wide the tensions between the Irish and English in Ireland. The Irish had long resented the repressive tactics of absentee landowners, many of whom were English and or Protestant. These landlords often evicted unsuccessful and prosperous tenants alike so as to raise rents for newcomers and to increase their own income. In 1879, opponents of these landowners formed the Irish National Land League and launched protests against these policies. Irish tenants, no longer bound by the public ballot system, elected a solid block of nationalist representatives to the British Parliament. The general liberal trend in British politics in the 1870s allowed for the return of William Gladstone as Prime Minister. The leader of the parliamentary liberals, Gladstone waged an experimental campaign in the North for a seat in the House of Commons. During his campaign, he spoke before thousands of working men and working women, calling for greater self-determination in India and Africa and asking his audiences to make an honest, manful, humble effort at the middle-class tradition of hard work. Newspapers around the country followed his speech tour campaign, and their coverage helped fuel public interest in politics. Queen Victoria bristled at Gladstone's speaking tour and at his attacks on her empire, vowing that he would never again serve as prime minister. But that wasn't her decision to make. The British liberals recovered parliament and, in fact, Gladstone returned as prime minister. 
Uh, his parliament continued liberal reforms. The Reform Act of 1884 doubled the electorate to around 4.5 million men, enfranchising many urban workers and artisans, and thus further diminishing the traditional aristocratic influence in the countryside. As many British men entered political life as first-time voters, both liberals and conservatives found it necessary to establish national political clubs so as to gain party loyalty. These clubs competed with the groups of parliamentary elites who had ruled through wire-pulling and had theretofore determined the course of party politics. In the 1880s, broadly-based interest groups like unions, businessmen's associations, and political clubs began to open up the political arena so as to appeal to more voters. Now, in Germany, political liberalism was still defined as constitutionalism, a philosophy that was criticized by the government and by its leader, Minister President Bismarck. Officially, the German Empire was a federal monarchy, meaning that the German emperor was head of state and president over the federated monarchs, the long-standing traditional heads of various German states such as Bavaria and Saxony. The German constitution enshrined this agreement and established the position of the chancellor, who was the head of government and president of the Bundesrat, the Council of Representatives from the German states. The German legislature, the Reichstag, was an elected body, and all German males over the age of 25 had been eligible to vote since 1871. Now, political parties in Germany tended to be much more fluid than those in Britain or even those in France, in the election of 1890, for instance, there were votes recorded for 12 different parties, everything from the Social Democratic Party, a socialist party formed from the merging of two workers' associations, which won the most votes, to the German People's Party, which was against Bismarck and the leadership of Prussia in the German Empire, to the anti-Semitic party, which existed. Bismarck's greatest concern post-unification was bringing together the competing political agendas of Germany's many parties. It was in the 1870s and 1880s that we can say his true dedication to Realpolitik was evident. While he hated their platforms, Bismarck dealt with liberals and socialists through compromise, often agreeing to liberal reforms so long as Bismarck and the conservative German government took credit for them. In the end, Bismarck recognized that the reforms were necessary. Germany had granted universal suffrage in 1871, and the German Empire was home to a prosperous middle and blue-collar voting class which expected government responsiveness. Uh, probably the most famous of these efforts was a series of insurance acts that began to establish a welfare system in Germany, the first of its kind. In 1883, Bismarck's government issued the Health Insurance Bill, which helped most German workers pay for medical treatment. In 1884, the Accident Insurance Bill paid disability to injured workers. Finally, Bismarck's 1889 Old Age and Disability Insurance Bill, which was essentially a social security program that paid elderly, over 70 years old, ex-workers a pension for their years of service was seen as the crowning achievement of the Reichstag that year. Of course, the average life expectancy at the time was 45 years, but if you made it to 70, it was all good. More pressing for Bismarck was the problem with the Roman Catholic Church, or rather, with its influence, especially in the very Catholic areas of southern Germany. By 1860, the papacy had lost much of its territories in Italy to the unification effort there, and since Pope Pius IX had been against unification, he was not well liked by unification-era Italian politicians. To try and reestablish his powers in Italy and elsewhere, he issued the controversial Doctrine of Papal Infallibility in 1870, which declared that the Pope, when speaking on matters of faith and morals ex cathedra, or from the chair, was incapable of error. As the Church had favored German unification under Austrian, not Prussian, auspices, Catholics became a target of Bismarck's in post-unification Germany. He launched the Kulturkampf, the cultural struggle, against Catholics, declaring them unpatriotic. Jesuits were expelled from Germany, and Bismarck extended state control over Catholic schools and over the appointment of Catholic bishops. He then seized church property and imprisoned or exiled nearly 2,000 priests. The move was devastating to the Catholic population, but particularly to the Pope, 
who never quite regained the same level of influence. It was partly in response to blatantly oppressive moves like this one that the Progressive German People's Party was formed. While mass politics had, in some ways, progressed the ideals of a more liberal electorate, it was, in other ways, paving the way for the social and economic problems of the coming century. Class problems, never totally eradicated, were nonetheless being addressed, but the continuing competition between nations and the focus on national identity, and this would be a more stringent form of nationalism than the nostalgic nationalism of the Romantic era, was once more highlighting minority groups which had long been held in suspicion. The cycle was coming around again, and, once again, the results would not be pretty. <laughs>